Hey, everyone. It's Deb Blum here from Inside Out Activism. And um, I wanted to talk today about our... I see a lot of people who are struggling. And I think that because of the pandemic and being in lockdown, it's definitely activating a lot in people. There are relational issues showing up. There's our own, I guess I would say maybe like watching our own patterns, our ability to to see some of the things that play out in our lives. Maybe we're not as busy as we usually are, so we're, we're slowing down and we're feeling more of our feelings. But one of the things I see is just many clients and friends and people that I see even posting on social media. There's a lot of struggle going on. And I felt like I just wanted to share a little bit about what I see and what's available to people. So I am, it was about nine, no, it was probably about 10 years ago when I can recall that I was in a really dark and hard place in my life. It was probably 11 or 12 years ago when I was when it was starting, when I was in the thick of some pretty rough times, but I it kind of peaked about 10 years ago when I nearly lost my marriage. So for the years before that, what was happening was that I was a mother of young children. My kids were, I don't know, I guess 12 years ago, they would have been four and um, what would they have been? Maybe three and five or something like that. And we were, I was a stay-at-home mom for the most part, and I loved it. But I also was in the midst of a whole bunch of other inner feelings. Things were coming up for me that I didn't understand. And that the at the root of everything um, was unresolved trauma, but I didn't know that at the time. And I was acting out in all kinds of ways that were were not serving me, but I didn't really know it. And I was doing things like trying, I was just constantly keeping myself busy. I was volunteering at the kids' schools. I was in the midst of um, some just, I guess, I would say just unhappy. I really was. And it was one of the first times in my life that I had been experiencing being unhappy. I had really, for the most part, always thought of myself as a a happy person who can just make the best of everything. I was an eternal optimist and I didn't understand what these feelings were that were coming up for me, but they were really powerful. And I blamed I blamed all of these feelings on others. So I was either blaming it on the people that were around me, like the women when I was in, uh, the kids were in preschool and elementary school. Why are they not including me? Why are they not, why are, why are their kids hanging out with each other and not my kids? And um, I was, I was caught up in a lot of self-criticism and fear and fear that I wasn't going to, fit in and awkwardness and all kinds of stuff and at the time I didn't even it didn't even enter my mind for one moment but after I was in therapy for a couple of years I was able to see that what it had triggered in me is my bullying experience I had a very severe bullying experience in my sophomore year of high school and it was with a group of girls and they were brutal to me and um, it ended it culminated with them threatening my life chasing me with a knife and actually chasing me in a car and threatening, literally threatening my life. And it's a a long story that we don't need to get into right now, but I didn't know that when I was going through all of this years and years ago, that that was what was being activated. So the social situations in the the, um, school, it was bringing up the social situation from my high school. And even though it was my kids that were in school, it was bringing up a lot of stuff for me. And so what that was doing was just causing me to feel more on edge. I was feeling a lot of, um, I don't even know if I could describe it. I felt a lot of, I used to say to people, I just don't feel attached to my life. Like I feel like I'm I'm living another life or something. 
I was very, it, I manif- it manifested a lot in my home with my husband. I was unhappy with him. I would called you. I would have called myself terribly unhappy with my marriage. I felt like he wasn't meeting my needs. He wasn't the right person for me. I blamed him for every feeling and stress that I had at that time. I genuinely felt like my only solution was to leave him. And I was fantasizing leaving my marriage and fantasizing how I could just get out and that if I would just leave my marriage, everything would be better. I had um, I had fantasies of the apartment that I would live in and how my life would be better. And, and it's amazing because what was happening really was there were issues in my marriage. Don't get me wrong. There were a lot of issues in my marriage, but um, I was... I was unable to see any of my own trauma, any of my own responsibility. I very much just was focused on on blaming, criticizing. I was always criticizing, so blaming, criticizing, judging, and just feeling like I was a victim of life. And I wonder if maybe there are people out there who can relate to that, who can relate to the sense that everything seems like it's just not going that well it's not going as I had hoped it would go and that other people were responsible and that I'm the person who um, I guess I'm just the person who's the victim and what I didn't understand at the time and that I do understand right now is that that was really a, a portal it was an entryway for me it was an invitation to do life a little bit differently Because believe me, when I was in that place, I was in the most suffering that I've ever experienced. So prior to that, I was more just ignorant and naive and oblivious. And I was just going about my life. But then when things started to rise up inside of me, I just thought that I was, I was literally like, am I going to suffer for the rest of my life? Like this, this is horrible. And that was why I was trying to change things on the outside. I was trying to change my circumstances. Maybe if we moved, maybe if I left him. Maybe if I lived by myself, maybe if I was divorced, maybe if I met another man, maybe if this would happen, I need other friends. My kids aren't, my kids need to go to a different school. I had all these ways that I wanted to solve the outside circumstances to make me feel better. And it seemed really, really justifiable. And the hardest part is that if I spoke to other people about this, everybody else was living the same way as me. They were all looking at how to fix the outside world. It was only over the years when I have figured out that the only way to fix the problems in our life and even in the world is from the inside out. It was when, it was when I realized that I needed to take responsibility for my own stuff. That it, as crazy as it seems, but it's true, is that all of the, the, the judgments and the blame and the criticism, they were all my ego defense mechanism just jumping in and trying to keep me safe. What was happening for me in particular was that I was having things from my past like my bullying and other traumas that were being activated and then they were showing up in my relationship with my kids and my husband and my my friends. So what was happening is that I would get triggered or I would get, I would get um, hurt, and then I would, instead of feeling the hurt, I would get defensive. I would engage coping strategies, like coping strategies like, like um, doing better, like volunteering more, becoming more valuable so that you, you know, like if people don't like me, at least they know that I do a lot for the school, you know, or um, just setting the bar higher for myself, expecting myself to do better, expecting myself to, it's kind of a funny thing, right? It's a little bit ironic because on the one hand, I was blaming the outside world. On the other hand, I felt unsafe in the world. And so the another mechanism for me is to keep myself feeling safe by being valuable, being liked, being uh, not upsetting anybody, not disappointing anybody. And so what was happening with my husband, which was kind of interesting, was that I was criticizing him and I was blaming him, but I wasn't telling him my deep feelings. I wasn't telling him what I was really going through because to be honest with you, I didn't know. 
I didn't know. That's just the truth. And I was in denial of my experience because my ego defense mechanism was so deeply entrenched and so much the loudest voice in my head that I believed everything that I thought. I believed everything. I believed that I, if I was thinking my husband was being insensitive, then he was. If he was being late and I judged that, then that was true and he should just be on time. Doesn't he see? And so I was so convinced that I was right and that I was 100% accurate in my judgments that I didn't have any wiggle room for something else. Well, my husband and I got to a point where the, the you know what hit the fan in a really, really big way. I was, I was really just, I had, I had really probably been the one that completely went off the deep end. And um, I'm not saying that my husband didn't have responsibility in this because he did. And we later worked through those things. But at that time, it was definitely me who was the one that was being incredibly activated by my past and it was showing up in my present and I was deeply entrenched in my ego's defense mechanism and coping strategies and I was I was miserable. Well, so when this happened, fortunately my husband did fight for our marriage and he said something to the effect of, you don't have the right to leave this marriage until you have done everything. We have children and you cannot just leave. Well, that, cat, that was a catalyst for me. It actually upset me a lot, but it did kind of knock me out of some of my, my um, like kind of almost arrogance and my sense that I knew everything and that I was just going to go solve my problems now. I was just going to go leave and I was going to change my outside circumstances so that I could feel better. Well, we ended up in therapy, luckily with the great therapist. We interviewed a few and we ended up with a wonderful one and and she guided us back to a much better place. Some of the things that we learned right in the beginning were um, things like that silences kill marriages and I think silences actually kill relationships. So the first thing was really for me to start to tell the truth of what I was experiencing. Well that was very hard because that meant that my husband had to hear a lot of stuff that he didn't want to hear. But luckily we worked with a therapist. We were in therapy for two hours a week, two times a week for the first probably six months because we were in deep, deep crisis and I was in deep crisis. I had no interest in connecting with my husband at the time, but what we did is I was in therapy where she helped me to see some things that I didn't, I wasn't seeing. She helped me to see things like that when I was judging my husband. They were really about things inside of me that I didn't like about myself or when I was criticizing. She helped me to see that I was really tough on myself and I was tough on others. She helped me to just crack the veneer a little bit to see that it was possible that I wasn't always right and that maybe there was some other part of the story that I wasn't understanding. She helped me to understand that when I was triggered that it was more about the past than it is about the present. But I didn't understand and luckily for me, I wasn't actually making a conscious choice to enter the, the, the inner territory in the way I, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I didn't know the, the work I was doing. But more and more I see people actually wanting a solution. They're, they're wanting to get out of the suffering like I was experiencing. They're wanting to find a way out, but they don't know how. They want a better life. They want to get to the other side, but they don't know what to do. And they're so captivated and mesmerized and addicted to their ego's defense mechanism. That's the only thing that they think is available. So they literally have a tool belt filled with all of these strategies that worked for them when they were very, very young because it does work for us when we're young. To sacrifice ourselves for connection when we're very little actually is a really smart thing to do. To, you know, to even defend our hearts when we're little can be a very healthy thing to do because it's the only thing it keeps us, it keeps us alive sometimes, especially when we've really suffered big T traumas. But most of us have suffered lots and lots of little T traumas like relational traumas and disruptions and ways that we didn't get our needs met when we were young. And what happens is they manifest themselves in, in our older years. And what we're doing is we, we spend most of our time trying to create 
situations where we get our needs met, where basically most of us are trying to almost like manipulate others to meet our needs. So for example, we have a need for validation maybe. And instead of val validating ourselves, we're always scanning and looking for people to validate us. And we're and when we don't get our needs met, when we don't get that need met, we feel frustrated and upset and angry. And then we lash out at other people or those people who aren't meeting our needs. So we can see that there are all these patterns that are happening in us that are from our childhood that are manifesting in our present day. And the problem is, is when we use our coping strategies, those are usually unconscious strategies. We use, we use these strategies to try to feel better, to try to get our needs met. So we, instead of actually slowing down, taking a breath and noticing that we have a need in that moment, and then trying to choose another tool or another strategy, we just keep engaging over and over and over again our old tools from our childhood. Even though they're not fitting and working anymore, even though they're damaging our relationships, even though we can feel ourselves suffering, even though we find ourselves needing to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and food and exercise and other things that keep us from feeling our feelings, even though we know we're doing all that, we don't really know another path. And the problem is it's because the other path isn't exactly well marked. Everyone has to go on their own, uh, their own journey. But I want to say this. I think I just want to invite people to understand that there is another way. And that's the beautiful thing. There is another way. So let's just, let, let me just break down a few things for you. The first thing is that we have this thing called the ego defense mechanism which is a really amazing part of us, right? It is the part of us that keeps us safe. It's the reason why human beings are still surviving because we have a really, really powerful part of our brain, the limbic system that keeps us safe. Um, even the reptilian parts of our brain, they keep us safe. They actually are the reason why, like if there's a real true emergency you want your ego defense mechanism to jump in because that's what gets you into fight or flight and it engages all the right parts of your brain and your body to engage and mobilize and to be able to keep you safe whether that be for you to run away whether that be for you to fight or whether that be for you to freeze it is an animalistic thing it is beautiful and amazing and when we need it if you're in a dark alley and something happens you want it it is great the problem is that often ours, our ego defense mechanisms have gone a little bit awry. They're, o they're on overdrive and they're on autopilot. We have come to believe that the way that we behave in the world is that that's the normal way to behave is with reactivity and defensiveness and with you know, our right and wrong and I know more than you and I'm the, I'm the you know, and they're like the Victor villain kind of thing or the, or the Victor, Vic, <laughs> Victor villain or, or um, victim, you know, like this, the drama triangle of like, I'm either, you're either like the savior or you're the victim or you're the person who is the, the, um, the perpetrator. And they're like a constant dance between these places and the winner and the losers. And all of those are egoic strategies for survival. And we have gotten to the place where we get upset about things that are even things like um, an email comes in, right? An email that wasn't worded right, or we misinterpreted or reinterpreted as a certain way, it can just trip off that part of our brain that brings us back to the chi our childhood when we felt unseen or unheard or that we weren't loved in the way that we needed to be loved or not cared for there are ways that it triggers these parts of us and then we get upset so in the present day we believe that the person who sent the the, the email to us is somehow our enemy or somehow hurt, trying to hurt us and we get our nervous system is just constantly being activated because we have all kinds of unresolved things from our childhood that are being activated by those present day situations. So what we know, what we know is that a trigger is actually a wound. It's actually something being triggered from the past. So there's a guy, uh, Michael Singer, who wrote the book, uh, The Untethered Soul, and he talks about thorns and that every time as a child, something happens to you that hurt you, 
a little thorn thorn gets put into your into your like heart let's just say but let's just say even your skin um and what happens is that every time in your present life that someone rubs up against that thorn so say like sends an email that is is uh it seems like they misunderstood you or something and it activates a time when you were young when you were misunderstood it it automatically hurts you and the the thing about it is that when we get hurt our um survival brain engages and it wants to fight against the other person or it wants to run away or it puts you gets you paralyzed and so you are trying to defend yourself but then in your adult years what happens is the more we do that it it like accumulates over time and and the more things that we have that are unresolved in us the more pain that we have inside of us that we're not looking at um it's like the emotional charge gets greater and greater and greater. And the thing is that the more that we have the emotional charge feeling greater, the more that our, uh, our survival brain decides that the safest thing for you to do is to cut off from that. So then we get more in our heads and more thinking and analyzing and more projecting outside and more like um, B- blaming other people and getting mad at other people and believing that that if everyone else would just change then you would be happy and I know that because I've been there but there's a point when we have to realize that the only path is inward and that actually every single one of those things and Byron Katie says everyone a hundred percent of the time these things that are happening are activating something inside of us. Now, don't get me wrong. Let me just say one caveat to this. It doesn't mean that people aren't doing things wrong that are hurtful. It can be that people are doing hurtful things. And so, but a lot of times it's actually triggering something from the past that needs to be resolved before we can see clearly. So let's just say you are in a situation that's genuinely an abusive situation. Sometimes what's really helpful is you, sometimes it's hard to tell. So people stay in abusive relationships for a long time because they have patterns in their past that keep them sort of in these, in these present day patterns. It's not until we actually go back and we take a look at some of the things that happened in our past and we feel those feelings and we explore it that we can then come back and more clearly say, actually, wow, I was a part of this dynamic and as I've changed, my partner seems to have changed too. That's really not, it wasn't really abusive. Let's just say there was an emotional charge in there. It wasn't really abusive. It was more just that we were not treating each other well because of our childhoods. But you also then get to see when you're in unhealthy relationships that are abusive that you need to leave. You need to leave them. But it helps to be able to more confidently assess those situations because we're all walking around with this lens, this ego defense mechanism lens that's actually cracked glass. We can't see clearly everything that's happening out there. We are seeing a reflection of ourselves but through a cracked glass lens so it's all muddy and murky so until we begin to see more clearly and understand that what we're what we're seeing out in the world is actually a reflection of stuff that's happening inside of us as we begin to do that work and we see more clearly then we get to assess when we need to set boundaries more clearly when we need to walk away when we need to speak up for ourselves or when we need to stay quiet we start to be able to, to make those be more discerning in our lives, to be able to choose how we respond with a, a sense of um, confidence in ourself instead of a se- and, and self-trust rather than reacting and just losing it on people because our ego has taken over. What I encourage people to do is that when you are being swept away by your ego it's usually because the ego has jumped very quickly into the driver's seat and is taking charge and so what we need to do is begin to notice that and become aware of that and to also know that there's another way 
that there that that ego is just one part of us and we have a prefrontal cortex and we have all other parts of we have an emotional center of our brain there are all other parts of us that can be engaged and so when we let the drive the ego get in the driver's seat what's happening is it's taking charge and all other parts of our brain shut down and we can't think we can't reason we can't have emotion and empathy it just cuts us off it, we literally get hijacked dan siegel talks about this so what we want to do is recognize we have other parts of our brain that we can engage and we want to take our ego and our so our ego is wonderful i said before it keeps us safe but not only that is our ego in general is part of what gets us up in the morning and has us do things and can be on this call listening here like our ego is wonderful it's just that we need to temper our ego we need to ask our ego to do what it does best which is just to help us to speak to us to communicate with us to show us what's happening but not to get so engaged and just jump right in so we need to take the ego we need to put that ego into the back seat and buckle it into a car seat and allow it to speak but just not allow it to jump into the driver's seat anymore not allow it to take the wheel so that is an amazing way to look at this but it's not as easy as that right it's just not as easy as that there's more to it than that there's a there's a um a way that that's great but you're still going to feel that strong impulse that voice is loud the ego's voice is the loudest voice the inner voice the one that's the whispering that's just saying like hey i'm hurt or the one that's just speaking up to, to try to call you back to yourself it's a quiet voice I remember a client one time telling me this years and years ago she said the ego is so loud and she said those whispers they're so quiet I can barely hear them so it does require us to change our lives a little bit we need to slow down a little and that's why right now what's happening is a lot of people in the silence in the quieter times in the lack of being able to be quite as busy as they were before they might be experiencing the loudness of that ego's voice but you also might be hearing the whispers a little bit more too so now you sense that little bit of dissonance like maybe there is some other way available to me where my ego isn't constantly running my life where my defense mechanisms aren't constantly showing up where my patterns aren't always playing themselves over and over and over again and so my invitation to you is to think about that there might be another way there might be another way to be able to do your life the challenge as i said before is it's not just a it's not an easily mappable plan for people it's not like i can just say to you well if you did just these three things everything's just going to change and you're going to get all better because every one of us has a different set of wounding we have a different set of relational traumas that we deal with we all have had different experiences and we all have currently different experiences and that means that each one of us has to find our own way but there are trailheads and there are breadcrumbs but the interesting thing about it is that you you most people think that those trailheads and those breadcrumbs are they're just they i think people think they're different than they are and the irony of the whole thing is that it is in the triggers and the judgments and the criticisms and the blame and the self-criticism and the self-judgment and the self-blame in the patterns that play out in our relationships all of those things are trailheads they are little markers that show us the way to another path and what they really are is the trailheads to our inner our inner selves to our connection to ourself so when we have this external orientation and we and we get that by the way because as a child what happens is we so if we end up being fortunate enough to have secure attachment with our parents which means that our children as children our parents are meeting our psychological and emotional and physical needs and we become dependent upon them and we become trusting of that they will meet our needs and we consistently can get our needs met by them 
What happens is we establish a relationship with ourselves that's secure and that we believe that the world is a good world and that we feel safe and that we feel that we can be, we are loved for who we are. We are loved and accepted and nobody is using, nobody is, is withholding love because of our behaviors. So there's a way that we have learned that we are, we are acceptable and we are good and we are lovable and we haven't had to sacrifice our authenticity for acceptance and love. If we're lucky enough to have had that happen to us, what will happen is we will, we will not need to be spending our time seeking love and validation and approval from others. But very few of us really get secure attachment. And by the way, I just want to say something about that. It appears that people get that children develop secure attachment not by having that those circumstances 100% of the time, but a mere 30% of the time. If you can believe that. So the the people have been studied, the research that's on this says that if you have had a parent who meets you and is able to provide for your needs 30% of the time, you're going to be pretty much in the category of had, having secure attachment. Now, that varies for people, and I'm sure that everyone has had their own experience with this, but what I want to say is the majority of people that I know have it, didn't get um, their needs met in the same way that I'm describing, and so what's happened is as a child, we had this orientation toward this, that we had to be a certain way in order to get the love and attention that we needed in our homes. So we oriented to the outside. We basically, instead of being given the gift of, of our parents, um, basically like mirroring for us, and showing our goodness and our love and our greatness and allowing us to stay connected to ourselves, what happened is we had to disconnect from ourselves. We had to disconnect from our feelings so that we could then look to our parents and to our siblings and other people in our lives and say, do you love me? Show me you love me. If I do this, will you love me? If I act this way, will, I, will you love me? And so we sacrifice our authenticity. We disconnect from ourselves and our feelings in order to be able to get those needs met. It was a really smart thing because actually our attachment needs, those psychological needs are so important. Our authenticity needs are important too, but they are actually second to our attachment needs. Our attachment needs, our need for affection and love and to be taken care of, those are incredibly important needs so when we have to look outside to actually um, seek to actually effortfully seek to get those needs met and when we have to be somebody for somebody else so when we have to be the good kid so that we'll get loved when we have to be the one that um, is proactively taking care of our parents or that we are the one that doesn't get upset or the one that we the one that makes everybody laugh and that's how we get our love and attention what happens is we turn off our cues inside we shut down our connection to ourselves so that we can get the needs met and that teaches us it sets us up for a lifelong journey of believing that other people are supposed to be meeting our needs that other people should be acting in a certain way so that we can feel loved that other people shouldn't treat us a certain way, that other people should do this. If we do this, why are they not doing that? And we, come, we, be, we become oriented to the outside. And what happens to that in that is then when we become adults, we still play that out. We still play that out as in our marriages, in our child parent-child relationship. So you know, we don't, we find ourselves even our children, with our children, not being able to, to meet their needs the way that, that they need to have their needs met because we're still seeking to be validated even by our children. We're seeking to be validated. Are, is, are we good enough? Are we lovable? We're constantly watching for, are we good enough and are we lovable? And we're sacrificing. We're maybe not speaking up to our partners or maybe we're not asking for what we need maybe we don't even know what we need because what we're doing is we're so internally almost ashamed for having needs 
because so many of us were shamed for having needs that we don't say, hey, I need a little bit of attention right now. Can you come snuggle me on the couch? We don't say that to our husbands or our wives. We instead act out or we are upset for them that they didn't know that we need that. They didn't do it. We did all these other things and we, we bought them you know, their favorite dinner and we made them their coffee and we did this and why are they not doing what I need? And what I have learned is that the more that I have come to understand my needs, the more that I can actually sometimes meet my own needs, but the more that I can actually ask to have my needs met. Now, I just want to acknowledge one thing. Asking to have our needs met doesn't mean that the other person needs to meet them, but it's just the beginning of a conversation and helping to understand one another better. See, the journey, this journey that I'm talking about, you do have to do it on your own. It is actually your own journey. But the good news is you don't have to do it alone. You can do it with other people. And in fact, if you do this journey with other people, it will be a faster journey because A, they will actually trigger you, which will allow you to find the places that in the past are unresolved, the the emotionally charged places that need to have some attention. But also, you will begin to show, you will begin to, uh, perhaps find uh, that you that you do have the ability to support each other to to meet the needs of the other person there is real value in human beings connecting with each other loving one another nurturing one another being there for one another but it's kind of this funny dance that in some ways you have to also be able to take care of yourself that until you start to heal your own pain, pain and wounds, it is you're so think about it like this, you know, if you want to go look at yourself in the if you need to look at yourself like on your nose, you cannot look at your nose, you need to look in a mirror, you cannot see yourself clearly, you can't even see yourself at all. So it's the same on your inner world, you mostly do need other people to reflect for you what is going on in your inner experience and human beings reflect beautifully what's happening in our inner experience. So if you're walking around in the world and feeling like nobody sees you or nobody hears you, chances are you're not listening to yourself. Chances are you're ignoring your inner messages. Chances are you're ignoring your body sensations or your feelings. If you believe that people are not respectful to you, chances are inside you, you are not being respectful to yourself. You disrespect yourself. You treat yourself poorly. And it is being show, shown to you in other people and the way they treat you. And my experience for this is that the more that I do my own inner work, the more that I own that if I'm judging you for doing something either to me or just doing something in general, that chances are there's something in me that is, that is wanting to be seen and integrated and even just accepted or loved and resolved and felt and I remember hearing uh, Byron not Byron Katie uh, Brene Brown said that when you judge another person you're actually just it's just it's something that you already do they just do it a tiny bit worse than you do (laughs) or a little bit more than you do and I love that because what I think it does is helps us to see that we're all judging people and you know some people say that you should stop judging and I don't actually believe you should stop judging I just believe that we should take our judges judgments and use them as fodder for our own personal growth just like we it's like I said before these are trailheads to your inner path and um, Byron Katie is has something called the work and you can find it on her you can actually look up the work.com and it is a, a series of questions that guide you back to seeing that a, most of the time when we're judging somebody we actually are uncovering a place inside of us that needs to be looked at and um, accepted and loved and integrated and so that is the, the, that's why I'm saying that this isn't something that we can show you as a pathway. But what you can do is see that every time you look outside of you to get a need met, every judgment you have outside of you, everything that you're looking at in the world and you're seeing is wrong or bad, 
those are really just opportunities to come inside and just ask the questions like what's going on inside of me that has me angry about that person and why they did that what's going on inside of me that feels so sad right now that I got excluded from that thing or or so angry that I got excluded because then you get to find the sadness because what we do know also is that anger is usually fear and sad's bodyguard and I know for me that is so true when I'm angry it's always a pointer for me to say what is going on with me what's my sadness what am I afraid of and I because I tend to be a little more of a fight personality and so the questions are you know how do you use the outside world to do this but you have to first believe in what I'm saying and it's a leap of faith but I can tell you that I am not the person who started this this has been for thousands and thousands and thousands of years we have all kinds of ancient wisdom that guides us back to ourselves you can look at the Buddha you can look at Jesus you can look at all types of of ancient wisdom like the Tao and you can see that it's always about that the outside world is actually kind of an illusion or uh, you know it's it's really our perceptions and our perceptions are skewed by those glasses I said that you put on that have the broken kind of foggy thing that we can't see clearly and that when we use the outside world as the opportunity to do the internal inquiry that's what Byron Katie's work is, but often it's inquiry work on what is this going on inside of me? What is the outside world activating inside of me? Why is there an emotional charge around this? Why am I getting upset about that thing? And you start to notice, like, how is it possible that one person's really upset by something and somebody else isn't? And you start to see that possibly it's because they have a history of something that causes them to be upset about that. And the other person doesn't have that history, which is why we know that this is really pointing to us. It's so far, so much more complex than what I'm trying to say, but yet the path is truly one step in front of the other. You don't need to know it all. Life will guide you. Life will guide you. Your soul will guide you. Those whispers inside of you will guide you. But even more importantly, literally those things that happen that cause you frustration and irritation and anger and pain and suffering, those are the pointers. Those are the trailheads. Those are the markers. And what happens is soon we get to follow those breadcrumbs, little breadcrumbs that guide us to ourselves. And it is when we reconnect with ourselves, like when we were a child and we reconnect to our feelings, those, that is when we start to feel alive. See, there's a fear that if you go into your feelings, that it's going to be a bottomless pit. It's going to be, it's going to overtake you and you are going to become a person who cannot handle, you're going to just lose it, right? Because it seems like it's so dark in there and there's so much pain, but actually, truly it's not. It's actually in, it's the resistance to it. It's the avoidance of it that is causing you the suffer, suffering. It's the, it's the shutting off and the staying in your head and trying to think and solve the problems and, and stay safe. That's the stuff that's causing you the suffering. It's when we go inside and we start to explore what is this body sensation? What is this feeling? What am, what is going on inside of me right now? It's that pathway. That's the one that heals. That's the one that integrates. We feel more whole because we start to collect all those pieces of ourselves that we rejected and we abandoned and we disowned. All the parts of us that we were told weren't okay. We start to collect all those pieces. And it doesn't mean we become them. Like, you know, if, if when you were young, you were told that you were, you know, you were too sensitive and you don't want to be that sensitive anymore. Listen, this just puts you in choice. You get to just look at these things and say, hey, how, who am I and how do I want to be in the world instead of our egos just sort of guiding us and having us on autopilot. But it is a courageous act. The act of deciding that you're going to take the path inward and of questioning the possibility that the way that you act in the world, the way that, you, that we all act in the world, most of us, this egoic way that we act in the world, causes us more suffering than we are usually willing to admit and it interferes with the relationships we want it puts up barriers to the love that we want 
It really, truly does. And the other path that I'm inviting you to join me on, that path, the inside out path, that is the one that liberates. That is the one that shows you the way to your truth. That is the one that creates the relationships that you deeply desire. It's the one that actually is going to change the world. Because when we heal from the inside out, we bring authentic compassion. We're able to feel into other people's experiences without it being something that we have to, that we're always making it about us. We're often making things about us. When, we act, when we're acting compassionate toward other people, a lot of times it's actually rooted in our own desire to get other needs met. But when we start to meet our own needs and when we start to heal our own pain, we start to see the world reflecting that for us. That's the irony of the whole thing. The more I love myself, the more people love me. It's crazy, but it's so true. The more that I meet my own needs, the more my husband willingly comes in and, and meets those needs for me. It is an absolute crazy law of the universe that says that like that which is in within is reflected out there. And so if every one of us heals our hearts and heals our wounds, if each one of us is able to show up with more authenticity and is able to heal and be more whole, we will literally change the world. So the question is, are you willing to take the leap of faith? Because nobody knows, anyone who gets on this path, we don't know. Usually what's happening is we're suffering so much that we're willing to take another, we're, we're willing to almost put our we're almost willing to put our hands and our li- our lives in the hands we're almost willing to put our lives in the hands of the people who have gone before us so it's like you know you may not believe that um, anything is going to change but you see other people who are living their lives with more inner peace and more freedom and more of a sense of of joy and and a sense of connection and love and and just a sense that things are Things look like they're better and you see them and you want that. And, you know, your ego tells you, oh, they're just like, they're, you know, they're just that way. They were just born that way. You have more trauma than them. So you would never be able to get that way. No, you can't have that. No, they have that because they're lucky. They have that because they must have just been born that way. They must have had a better childhood than you. That's your ego talking. It's, this is available to everyone but it is the courageous path. It's the path that that makes you, you have to stop living on autopilot. We have to stop letting the ego's voice run us. We have to stop taking the bait because the thing about the the ego is the ego is so seductive and the instant gratification that we experience by following the ego's call is so powerful and seductive that it will keep bringing us in. It keeps on doing it. And even when you make a decision to choose another path, it will. It takes a very, very long time. It, it takes little teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny, tiny changes that add up to a lot that start that one day you say, wow, I'm not as triggered as I used to be. Or wow, things are going really well for me. Or wow, like I'm feeling good in my life. You start to feel more of this stuff, but it takes us taking that initial leap of faith to do it. We have to look at the the ego and and say to the ego, thank you so much for all your beautiful help. You've really saved my life. You were so important to me for so long, but you've been working so hard. Can I please, please, I beg of you, can you please help me by just being a little more quiet? I remember I was um, getting some I was getting coaching by this woman, Shakti Gawain. She's an author. You can find her if you want to read her books. And this was years ago, many years ago. And she lived in Mill Valley and she took on clients. And I worked with her and she did this work that was voice dialogue work where you would talk to the parts of you inside of you. And I remember saying that like my part of me that was the protector, the ego part of me, that protector was so fast that it just swept in so quickly that my other part of me, the other parts that wanted to have a voice, couldn't even get in there fast enough. And so the, the, that ego voice would just come in there and I, it would be like right there and it would just be taking over so fast and just protecting, protecting. 
And so I had to allow some space and I had to ask my ego, can you just see if it's possible? Like I'm, I'm the parent here and I can, t- I can handle this. Can you just allow a little more space for more voices to come in that might have other uh, thoughts about what we can do in this situation? And over time, I started to create that spaciousness. And now when I'm in a situation where I'm, I'm um, triggered by something, which is far more rare than it used to be, I have a lot more awareness. I have my ego's voice, but I also have the voice of presence and the voice of love and the voice that knows that um, things are going to be okay and the voice that can calm myself down. And, um, you know, and I have learned how to regulate my nervous system proactively. I've also done ongoing work to regulate my nervous system through meditation and other programs that I've done. But the invitation is to walk into the cave. And that's the key. There are many, many caves and some will look scarier than others. Probably the darkest caves are the ones that have the best, the most important information the most important healings. But it does require you to take a leap of faith. And it requires that you trust some of the people like me and others who have already entered the cave. And imagine what you're trying to do is you're trying to get to the other side of this, right? You're trying to get the other side and you think that you can go around that big mountain with the cave, but you can't. You cannot go around. You must go through and over and all around many, many different trails. And some are going to be simpler. You can just go up to the top and back down again. And some need you to go through into a dark cave that requires you to trust. You listen to the trailheads, you watch them and you follow the trailhead that feels like the most the the trailhead that feels most right for you to enter. And you follow that trail and you follow those breadcrumbs. And those trailheads are the triggers, those trailheads are the judgments, those trailheads are the pain. And they do guide you into these other places. But what we're here doing, all these people that have have done this, is we're holding a lamp or we're like a, a lighthouse for you. And we are showing you that you can take that first step. And we're here with you. And we're guiding you into that dark place. But the really cool part is that at one point, at some point what happens is yes you're walking and it sometimes feels very dark and you feel very alone and there are other times when people are there and they have their light and they're shining their light and showing you a little bit more down the path you take some more steps and you're back into some darkness but one day one day all those layers that you've put on you those masks and all those protective defense mechanisms that had you covered up they start to peel away enough that your own light starts to shine And soon you get to see and look around in this cave and not only are you able to see more clearly, but you see that the inside of you is actually far more beautiful than you ever knew. That you are far more beautiful than you ever knew. And you look around inside this cave and then you start to even wonder, where am I going? Do I really need to get anywhere? Because it's pretty beautiful in here. And then you start to realize that there are other people in the caves too. And you're not so alone. And people aren't so out to get you. And you aren't so, you aren't, that everyone's as insecure as you. And that everyone's feeling the, you know, going through their own strife and struggle as you are. But we're all in it together. And you start to realize, wow, life from the inside out is actually beautiful. Now, we might actually eventually get through this journey to the other side. And I do think that in some ways I'm on the other side in certain avenues and spaces of my life. In other places I'm still inside. But mostly I will just say is I like to be inside. I like to be living on the inside because I love myself now. I do. And I can look around. And even if I see a little part of myself that's dark and I'm like, huh, and I go down a little path, I I know that I will come to love that part of me too. And so I'm in and out of the cave. I'm sometimes triggered back into another, on another trailhead, following those breadcrumbs into another part of my psyche and into my, my being. But I can hear my soul's callings more. I can show up more fully. 
I'm willing to climb to the top of the mountain and to show up as me. I'm willing to walk through the other side and see what's going on. I'm willing to listen to your perspectives and to hear other people's points of view. I climb to the top of the mountain to look down and to see how, what am I missing? What am I not seeing? The mountain that is me is multifaceted. I have all kinds of ways that I can travel my inner and outer territories. I can use life to help me as fodder for my growth, for my healing, for my own path. And the question I have for you is, are you interested in joining an inside out path with me? Because it is a leap of faith. I'm not going to lie. You have to take that first step and then another step and another step, but you don't have to just jump off of a mountain or plunge in or run into the darkness. You can do it at your own pace and you can do it slowly. But the first thing you have to do is be willing to take action because information and knowing all of this is only one step. And I'm not judging. You can stay on the path of information for a very long time. I did a lot of the information path for a very long time, watching Oprah's Super Soul Sundays and reading books and taking it all into my brain. But it wasn't until I learned how to embody it and that I was willing to actually take tiny courageous steps toward authenticity and healing and vulnerability and intimacy. It wasn't until I was willing to take those tiny steps that my life really started to change. So you do, you do have to be willing to take that step and you do have to, you have to, after you've read all those people's books, someday you will realize that they're telling the truth and that there is another way to do life and that it does require you to push your edges of your comfort. You need to get out of that comfort zone. You do need to, to make a commitment to some changes in your life. But I can promise you that when you do, and if you do do that work and you take that courageous, those courageous steps toward living your life more true to yourself, toward into, to the more intimacy with yourself, to vulnerability, to feeling your feelings, to seeing what's true for you, to going beneath the defensive mechanism the defense mechanisms and to realize that the thing is never the thing, the thing that you think is true, your interpretations of the world, your interpretations of yourself, those things are actually just based on your experiences and your way that you defend yourself. It's very normal and healthy, but we can go under it. We can go inside. And when we go inside, we then begin to see our beauty and the light And then we get to shine it for other people. And if each one of us continues to do this work, all of us will be shining our lights brighter. More people will find their way on the path. It won't be as hard for other people. As it is, it's already changed for people. It is easier to get on the path now than it was 10, 15, 20, thousands of years ago. So it's, it's here and we're all inviting you. This is not just me. I'm one of many, many, many people. We're inviting you to take an inside out path. And if you're willing to do it, there are a lot of people who are out there to help you. So join us, join me. Continue to watch these videos. I will continue to bring people who are already on their path and they will share more and you will be guided. We all have our little lights and we're showing a little bit, just a little bit because each one of us is just one part of this huge, huge universe. But each one of us is a critically important part and you are critically important. And if you're walking around allowing that ego defense mechanism to make you be comparing yourself to others, not showing up fully and feeling fearful of being your true self, then you're not living your truest potential. You're not living the reason why you're here. This process of self-realization and you showing up as you and being you in this world, you are necessary. Your voice, your opinions, your thoughts, your you, your gifts, your talents, your quirky little flaws, every piece of you is we are begging you to show up. We are begging you to be you because without you, something's missing. Without you, Something is missing and life will not feel complete until you show up. So join us in the cave and I promise you it's not as scary as you think. 
it's not as scary as you think. It might be hard, but it'll be worthwhile. Thank you so much.